He came from what's now known as Weymouth, Mass, about 18 miles south of here. And he asked the tribe if he could live there year round. They said, sure. So he came up here with a couple of cattle and some fruit trees. The um, Indians taught him how to grow corn, squash, and beans. Life was good for five years. In 1630, a group of Puritans, they were a breakaway group from the Church of England, came from Boston, England, and arrived in Charlestown, Mass, just across the river here. And they soon learned there wasn't enough drinkable water in Charlestown for such a large group. So they came over to Shawmut, met with the Reverend Blackston, and said, can we live here? He said, sure. He knew some of them from Cambridge College. The um, Boston grew. By 1770, uh, Boston was the busiest port in the colonies. Uh, and then Boston has since grown to 40 times its size. Right now, uh, they did it by filling in naked land, mainly. The biggest chunk was the Back Bay. In uh, 1859, they took dirt and rock from Needham Mass, which is about eight miles west of Boston, filled in the Back Bay, and then they got over a million spruce trees, and they hammered them to the blue prey for foundations to build buildings in the Back Bay. Charmin Peninsula used to have three hills. They took down two of them, filled in the mill pond, and then they annexed neighborhoods such as Dorchester and Charlestown become the size it is now. In uh, 1754, uh, England was at war with France, and it was called the French and Indian War here in the colonies. The English government gave the colonists weapons, uh, taught them how to shoot, and how to fight, and uh, as a result, the English government beat the French and Indians, and after the war, the English government said, hey, you people here in the colonies are going to have to help pay for it. So they put a tax on tea, legal documents, uh, paper. The colonists, particularly two of them, one is named Sam Adams, who's head of the Sons of Liberty, he said, uh-uh, that's taxation without representation. So another colonist named John Hancock, he's the, by far the richest guy in Boston. He was a merchant. He said, let's do a protest. So they got 60 of their buddies together in a church in downtown Boston on December 16, 1773. And they marched down to the Boston Harbor dressed as Mohawk Indians. And they threw a bunch of untaxed tea into Boston Harbor. It's called the Boston Tea Party. This protest caught the attention of the English monarch and the king and parliament shut down the port of Boston and half the Bostonians left. There was no work here. They joined militia groups and with the port shut down, uh, troops were here. They knew they were going out to Concord in Lexington to help um, capture John Hancock and Sam Adams for their role in the uh, Boston Tea Party. So on April 18, 1775, uh, Bostonians had a single system led by Paul Revere, who lives in the North End, had lived in the North End here, and he had a friend in the Old North Church named Robert Newman. He said if the British were going to march towards Concord, in Lexington, if they were taking the water route, he would hang two lanterns up in the Old North Church. So late on April 18, 1775, 700 English soldiers got in the boats, went over to Cambridge, two lanterns were hung in the Old North Church. Paul Revere, one of several couriers, got in his boat, went to Charlestown, got on a four-wheeled horse, rode off to Lexington, and he got there to warn Hancock and Adams, get out of town, the British soldiers are coming to arrest you. That they did, and then he rode on to uh, Concord Bridge along with William Dawes. They um, warned the militia groups that the British were coming. They stopped them at Concord Bridge and the American Revolution started on April 18, 1775. 
on this corner in 1875, Alexander Graham Bell was working on hearing enhancement devices when he spilled a little acid on them. And he called out to his assistant, Watson, come here. The first telephone call was made. Um, also in Boston, the first telegraph, uh, Samuel Morse, he grew up in Charlestown, Mass. He came up with the first telegraph, Morse Cove. We had the first newspaper here in Boston. Uh, the first, oh, roller skates were invented in Boston. And a dentist came up with the idea of a golf tee in the latter part of the 1800s. In front of us here is Government Center. The low building in the middle in front of the clock tower there, that's currently City Hall. Well, it still is City Hall. Uh, Michelle Wu is our current mayor. She's uh, our first Asian American mayor. The building to the left here is the John Fitzgerald Kennedy Building. And behind me are the county court hunt, uh, offices. Towards the um, north end, the north end is Boston's oldest neighborhood. It's gone from English to Jewish to Irish to Italian. By far the best place to get Italian food and cannolis. And if you look off to the left here, you're going to see the old North Church, this white steeple there. That's where Paul Revere's friend hung those two lanterns. Uh, they'll let it be known of a water crossing. After that event, uh, the British soldiers were around to other churches in the city and boarded up the steeples so they couldn't use churches as a single uh, uh, tower again. To the left here, hay market, old days hay for the horses, now produce for your supper table. Down to the left here, Hanover Street, we'll take you right to the middle of the north end and just a little like a third of the way down across from the second light if you like cannolis it's a place called modern pastry that's my favorite cannoli place well a lot of people like mike's and just a couple more blocks down on the left um it's old but it's cool it's like if you ever, ever have been to europe this is the most european type neighborhood Union Oyster House, the oldest continually operated restaurant in the U.S. These six glass towers here each have one million numbers etched into it. Uh, it represents the six million Jews that perished during World War II during the Holocaust. It's part of the Wingland Holocaust Memorial. All the red brick buildings you see on the left is what they call the Bull French Triangle is the oldest retail segment in Boston. And right now we're behind City Hall, which is uh, the red brick and concrete behind us. Coming into full view, full view uh, on the left is the Emanuel Hall, the oldest town hall and marketplace. Behind that is Quincy Market, another marketplace. Good place to get souvenirs. They have free street entertainment. Up ahead at this intersection is where the Boston Massacre took place in March of 1770. What occurred is um, a week before, in, uh, earlier in March, a teenage boy was shot and killed by a British customs official. So about a week later, a group of teenagers, I think it was on a Friday night, came marching up State Street here. And on the corner here on the left was a British soldier standing guard in front of the customs house. They started heckling the soldier. The soldier kind of tapped them with his musket. They ran across the street to a pub and the patrons came out and started yelling at the soldier. He called for backup. The British barracks was located on this corner back then. Seven soldiers came out to his aid. They all met in the middle of this intersection. The colonists started throwing snowballs, clams, wherever they could to knock the hats off the British soldiers. A shot rang out. British soldiers returned fire. 
killing five colonists. The next day, all eight British soldiers were brought to this red brick building on the right. It's called the Old State House, built in 1713. You could tell it was the site of English uh, rule here in Boston. And as we get closer, take notice of the golden line at the top of the building representing England and the silver uh, unicorn representing Scotland. So they brought the, the soldiers into this building, which also served as the courthouse. John Adams, who was our second president, he represented them for the six uh, soldiers were found not guilty of manslaughter. Two of them were found guilty of manslaughter and they had to wear a tattooed M on their thumb and they were all sent back to England. Also on this balcony, uh, back on July 4th, 1976, Queen Elizabeth II from England came and gave an address. We had a big crowd of people here, was in that crowd. And she was very nice. She said, hey, all's forgiven, right? And also on this balcony, every July 4th, they read the uh, Declaration of Independence from that balcony. It's kind of a multi-use building. It's now part of the State Street T-Stop. Um, but uh, it is uh, a private organization that runs the, with the governor's side of the building and the court on the uh, which would say the north side. Welcome to hot Boston. Not usually this hot here, but you're lucking out. Um, the street to the left here is Washington Street. It's the uh, longest street in Massachusetts. It goes all the way down to Rhode Island. This is Court Street. Back in the 1700s, uh, a lot of uh, colonists uh, and visitors to Boston did not know how to read and write. So what the merchants did, they have what they call pictographs. They put symbols outside their shops to tell you what is being sold inside, such as a boot for a shoe store and books. So over here on the right, what do you think is being sold there? Tea and coffee, smart people on this tour. That's, um, this uh, used to be in front of the Oriental Tea Company. It's 228 gallons of uh, water in that. That is contributing to the humidity here today. But um, the Oriental Tea Company uh, was located just around the corner uh, from 1854 to the 1960s when they moved it here. This whole area to the right is called Government Center. It's part of a massive urban renewal project in the 1960s. We're going down Tremont Street, but more importantly, there's a Dunkin' Donuts here. So let's see if what they tell me works out. So, and it's open. All right, so feeling lucky? What? Not quite for everyone. Oh, there's plenty more, believe me. <laughs> Here on the left is uh, King Chapel Burial Ground. Uh, the first governor of Mass in Connecticut uh, buried there. The American flag is on Old City Hall. In front of that is where the first free public school in the United States is. King's Chapel uh, here on the left is the oldest Anglican church. The Puritans, when they came to Boston uh, in 1630, they had a charter for the whole state of uh, Massachusetts. And in that charter, they said, our religion is the only religion. So if you weren't a Puritan, you couldn't live in Massachusetts or Boston. Uh, towards the end of the 1690s, the Puritans started hanging everybody and they inadvertently hung a cousin of the king they lost their charter, and the Church of England put that church here and let them know who's boss. Here on the oh, left is the Omni Parker House, the oldest continually operated hotel in Boston, I mean in the U.S., and it's home of the Boston Cream Pie. And in 1913, Vietnamese leader Ho Chi Minh was a pastry chef in here. 
Also, in the 1860s, mm -hmm. Charles Dickens came over from England and he finished up writing the Christmas Carol by staying in this hotel and he did the first reading of the Christmas Carol in what is now a, a church, but back then it was a theater. This theater turned church is the first integrated church in the United States. Black, white, rich, poor, uh, all could go to church here. You see a red brick on the sidewalk here on the right. It's part of what they call the Freedom Trail. It's a 2.4 mile trip around Boston. And on a cooler day, it'd be a nice walk around the city. You see 14 different historic sites. We're on Tremont Street and we're on the right here is the Granary Burial Ground. Uh, it's kind of like the Revolutionary War Hall of Fame. Uh, you have uh, Paul Revere buried there, Sam Adams, John Hancock. Uh, the graveyard also has ghost tours at night. And this is probably the best place for a ghost tour because it's a, they built this graveyard on top of a spring and the bones tend to percolate up. But anyhow, that's Sam Adams' grave here on the right. And you could have a cold Sam Adams by looking at a cold Sam Adams. And he's buried along with five of those victims of the Boston Massacre. The group of people in the back there are looking at Paul Revere's grave. He's buried there along with 14 of his 16 kids, two wives. In the middle is a monument to Ben Franklin's parents. Ben Franklin was born in Boston, but at the age of 17, he got into a fight with his brother. He went down to Philly. And that big monument you see over to the, towards the Red Brick Building, that's John Hancock's grave. John Hancock had that big signature on the Declaration of Independence. He was the first governor of Massachusetts after he got our independence from England. And he's the richest guy in Boston. Uh, he actually had his mansion, sorry, torn down from um, top of Beacon Hill so they could build the current state house. Suffolk Law School, nice new law school. Brother that went there. This Red Brick Church, Park Street Church on the steps in 1831. They sung the song America for the first time. Get a quick look at the current state house. That might be my gold up there. I'm not sure. This building on the right, first stop, first subway system in the U.S. Uh, 1897. Boston was the first city to use electric motors in the subway uh, system. It wasn't a very big system. It just went to the end of the park, but we were first. We beat New York by three months. That's all that matters. Down to the left is the uh, downtown crossing, kind of your average retail section. Another Dunkin' Donuts. All right. Get ready for this. Feeling lucky? What? What? Very good. And no result. Maybe, maybe they got email to me. I don't know. Here on the right, uh, you're going to see a sculpture called the Embrace. It's just a little bit in the Boston Common here. The Embrace captures the moment when Martin Luther King Jr. is embraced by Coretta Scott King upon learning that he won the 1964 Nobel Peace Prize. Martin Luther King Jr. went to Boston University. He met Coretta here in Boston, and he had lived in the South End, which is just about a mile and a half down this street. We're now in the theater district, home to Emerson College, a theatrical school. A couple of the graduates there, uh, Henry Winkler went there. Uh, and what kind of grades you think Henry Winkler, the Fawns, got at Emerson College? Oh, A's, right, of course. You people are smart. In the theater district in 1900 had over uh, uh, 40 theaters, now it's about a dozen. Uh, the Colonial Theater is just behind me, probably the nicely decorated one. The Boston Opera, the Boston Ballet. Up ahead is the Wang Theater, more of a musical venue. 
uh, over time, they collected uh, artifacts, you get like posters, guitars, guitar picks of different performers that had performed there, like Bruce Springsteen, James Taylor, Carly Simon. Also, the uh, theater district has comedy clubs, you know, Blue Man Group. To the left here is Boston's uh, Chinatown, fifth largest in the U.S. Uh, Boston's Chinatown has grown out of Boston into Quincy. We just went by the Majestic Theater. In theaters, when there's not a production uh, or uh, practice, they put a light on the stage. It's called a ghost light. And back in March of this year, the ghost light went out in the Majestic Theater there, so now they're saying they have a ghost. Two applause. few other first the throw out uh, Boston in the back bay the publishing house came up with the first Christmas cards uh, we also uh, had the uh, uh, first police department to use a motorized vehicle first shipment of bananas anywhere in the United States came to Boston there was a lot of important stuff but the first safety razor was here in Boston as well. Here's another Dunkin' Donuts. Yep. We'll see. Boston was called Porsche School of Law in 1908. The reason I mention it, this was the first law school open exclusively for women back in 1908. Then it let men in there to the late 1920s. And the founder of Porsche Law he was a fan of Shakespeare. And in The Merchant of Venice is a woman who dresses up as a male attorney to help represent her friend in an Italian court, thus Porsche Law. We're at the edge of the back bay. Uh, so back in the day, as we make this left-hand turn, if it was before 16, 1854, you'll be driving into the Charles River. But now we're in the back bay. Uh, the back bay was created mainly because uh, the nice neighborhood of Watts at that time was called Beacon Hill, and it was full. Um, so the uh, Commonwealth of Mass and the city of Boston didn't want to lose that good tax base, so they created a neighborhood. It is made up of, uh, we're in the business section, uh, the back bay, mainly publishing houses, uh, insurance companies like John Hancock, Liberty Mutual, uh, and then there's two retail streets, Burleston and Newberry, and there's four residential streets. Instead of uh, naming streets like 1st Ave, 2nd Ave, 3rd Ave, 